Hi folks, Sword here again. Today we're going to be talking about sword dynamics charts and how to interpret them and how they can help you compare two swords to one another even if you can't physically go and handle them yourself. These are very interesting tools that were designed originally by Peter Johnson and Vincent Le Chevalier with uh, using the weapons dynamics computer. Uh, we have the ability to generate them now. I have another video on how to do that. Today we're just going to be talking about the output and how to interpret it. As an example today, we're going to be looking at this beautiful LK Chen um, Flying Phoenix Jian from the Han Dynasty. Um, this is one I've previously measured, so we already have the output entered. Now keep in mind, this is a handmade sword, and it has variations in it as you would expect any handmade object. So if you happen to own this very specific example or this very specific model, go ahead and do the measurements yourself you may find that your numbers are very slightly different from the ones that I've come up with. And so anytime we're looking at one of these, keep in mind, these are specific to individual swords that individuals like myself and like you have measured. And you should always interpret it that way. There's no one graph that represents an entire model of swords unless each and every one was exactly the same down to the atom. So uh, keep that in mind whenever you're looking at these charts. Number one, they represent single sword. To dive right in, the first thing we're going to talk about is the effective mass curve. So the effective mass curve appears as a bluish pink hill kind of on the bottom of the chart. It displays the approximate percentage of the sword's mass that is required to move the sword at any given point, with the highest peak representing 100% of the sword's mass. Let's leave swords behind for a second and take a look at this hammer. This hammer does not have its mass evenly distributed across its whole length. It has more mass concentrated over here on the head, very little mass drawn out here in the wooden grip. A small amount of effort or mass is required to displace and move the grip here, whereas a larger amount of effort or weight is required to make a difference and move the head of the hammer. That represents the difference in size in each portion of that little hill at the bottom of the mass, uh, the effective mass uh, slope. In the very center, where the hammer is resting on my hand, would represent the very peak of that hill, and 100% of its mass is required before the hammer will move. I have to lift up using the exact amount, the opposite amount of weight, before the hammer will budge. That corresponds to another point that we'll talk about in a second. Going back to a sword for a second and taking a look at the Jian, the distribution of mass is the reverse of what you saw in the hammer. In this case, the grip actually has more of a concentration of mass, and very little is, by contrast, distributed and pulled out into the blade. So a small amount of force, a relatively small amount of force, is required before the blade will have an action, and a larger amount of force is required in order to move the hilt. The point at which it is balanced, as before, re represents the top of the hill, where the 100% um, of the mass is kept. The distribution of that effective mass can change the handling properties of the sword. If a larger portion of it is kept out in the blade, the blade will strike harder. However, it can become less responsive. If more of the effective mass is pulled back, so we have less of it in, in the, the tip and more of it closer to the grip, then the blade may become more maneuverable and easier to fence with but the blade may suffer in its ability to strike, may hit with less authority at that point. As are most things with sword design, there are always trade-offs and compromises. So you're constantly battling and deciding what is going to be the, the better compromise for the given uh, situation you're designing the sword for. In this case, the Flying Phoenix has a pretty good balance between both um, weight in the blade and nimbleness in the hand. The uh, distribution of mass perhaps is very slightly on the lighter side of the blade. Next up, we're going to look at inertia and rotational inertia. These are represented by the pale oval and the hourglass type figure directly behind the outline of the sword. So first, if we look at just the oval, which is centered on the hilt, this represents how easy or difficult it is to move the hilt in any direction. So the actual inertia of the sword. If a sword has a lot of inertia to overcome and will tend to stay in one place at the hilt, it'll have a relatively small oval. This can be useful in some fencing systems where you're trying to avoid having your weapon displaced, but it will make it less maneuverable in space. A large oval shows a sword which can move very swiftly from the grip and is more commonly seen on smaller swords and ones with lighter hilts. As expected, this allows the sword to move more quickly up and down or in and out from the hand. 
again, going back to the flying phoenix, in this case, the inertial oval is reasonably large. And as a result, it can move up and down and in and out relatively easily than a sword that might have a big complex guard, a knuckle bow, a big heavy pommel on it that would cause a lot of inertia, especially concentrated here on the hilt. The hourglass figure shows rotational inertia and specifically looks at how easily the sword can pivot at the point measured from the base of the blade. You can think of it as how agile the tip of the sword is when being held in the hand. A very wide arc indicates a blade tip that is very, very easy to swing around, but may be difficult to keep in one position. By contrast, a narrow arc shows a tip that wants to remain in one position and will not be easy to swing from the grip. This rotational inertia is highly dependent on where the back of the sword is being pivoted from. So swords which are being used in two hands instead of just one often will have much wider arcs than when just being used in a single hand. So the rotational arc of this Hanjian is actually reasonably narrow compared to many types of similar swords. The tip generally stays reasonably steady wherever it's pointed and it's a little hard when used in one hand to get it to swing it's not terrible but at the same time it's not the fastest or most uh, maneuverable sword if by contrast i apply a second hand to it and now i'm operating it in two hands it suddenly becomes very easy to swing in two hands and as a result the rotational arc becomes much larger if we were to compute it that way for the purposes of this exercise, we'll just be continuing to look at it as just a single-handed sword. Next, let's take a look at the three lines that drop down from the sword blade into the mass curve. The center line, which is black and dotted, crosses the mass curve right at the top of the peak. This is the center of mass of the sword, also called the point of balance or the center of gravity. It is the point that the entire sword can balance. The position of this point will help determine how lively or sluggish a sword blade is in part. As we discussed before, this is the very top of the effective mass curve, and it's the point at which the sword balances. So every object has a center of gravity. It's no different than swords. In most cases, with a straight sword, it'll be directly in the middle of the blade. If the blade was extremely curved, it might be slightly off the side of the blade's profile, which makes it much more difficult to measure. Fortunately, this one is, is easy. As discussed before, the position of this point of balance will help determine in part if the blade is lively or not. And as a result, this becomes slightly over-discussed in sword circles and especially in online retailers of swords, uh, in part because it's very easy to measure. So you can tell how heavy a sword is just by putting on a scale. You can easily measure the length of the sword or the sword blade. And just as demonstrated, you can also show where the center of gravity is very easily. It's true that it does contribute to if a sword feels very blade heavy or perhaps blade nimble. If the closer the center of gravity gets to the hilt, generally speaking, the more lively it becomes. The further it goes away, the more heavy it's going to strike and the more sluggish and, and less responsive in the hand. However, as we've seen, that's not the only answer to, to that particular question. There are more details and design features of a sword that determine how it's going to behave and respond and compare to a different type of sword, especially one of a radically different design. Next up are the two blue lines. These are called nodes of vibration. So a well-made sword is a marvel of engineering and it is kind of like an airplane's wing. It has to be long, but also strong and light and flexible. When it strikes something, the sword will move. The blade, if it's a, the blade, will move and vibrate and flex. Even a long blade like this beautiful Jian will bend. It's reasonably stiff, but it'll, it will still bend. However, there are a couple of positions along the length of the blade that are less likely to move and tend to, to feel stiffer. These are referred to as vibrational nodes. We have two vibrational nodes, one of which will appear in the blade and it usually appears in the 20 to 30% of the distance down from the tip of the blade. So if I strike the blade, there's a point right about here where the blade does not vibrate basically at all. A second point is near the grip of the sword and we refer to it as the hilt node. However, that's a little bit of a misnomer because it's not always in the grip. It can be in the guard. It can even be on the blade depending on the sword type. For instance, some types of rapier have 
this node a little bit in front of the, the grip in some cases. And the same thing happens. If the, if the blade is vibrating because of movement, there is no motion in this portion of the hilt. The position of these nodes have important implications for how the sword behaves, how it cuts, how it uh, operates. For example, in the hilt node, if you are gripping the jun in a position which is outside of the hilt node and the hand is struck, the blade will vibrate. If you're holding it within the hilt node, the blade tends to stay steady. The reverse is true. If you are striking a target or are struck by a target around the blade node, there is very little hand shock and very little energy is lost due to uh, vibration of the blade. Following these lines down to the bottom of the graph are numbers. The first shows the total mass of the sword and is drawn directly below the center of gravity since it represents the total weight of the sword. The other number is the mass at the pivot point which occurs at the blade node and is presented in both grams and the percentage of mass of the total blade. There's a second blue line which represents the mirrored pivot point in the hilt. It's often very close to the hilt node. There's also a pale white line which just represents the point at which the hilt and the blade meet, the center point for the inertia graphs. So the last thing we're going to talk about are pivot points, which are represented as these little red marks along our graph. Um, these are a series of paired points which occur first on the hilt and then again on the blade. There are always two of them, so where, wherever we have a pivot point or actually an action point on the hilt, we will have a corresponding pivot point on the blade. Um, although you can have any number of them, you can have an infinite number of them, we have two that are of particular interest. One which occurs near the grip and one which, which we'll call the forward pivot point and one which occurs basically as far back on the grip as you can right next to the pommel, which we're going to call the aft pivot point. If I impart an action on the sword holding it at the forward pivot point, there will be a corresponding place on the blade where it appears to hover in midair and not move. I'm waggling the sword back and forward, and there's a spot right here where it appears to not move. If I slide to the aft pivot point, there's a different pivot point further backward on the blade where the same is true. These have implications for how the blade handles and are very important, for example, what, depending on what systems of fencing the sword is intended for. Um, if it's used in one hand, if it's used in two hand, if you're intending to keep the point of the sword in line all the time and keep it steady, if you're intending to move the sword through different wards and, and protect one another, if you're trying to slip the sword around things, being able to keep a portion of the sword steady and in one spot and while you're manipulating the back of the sword um, is very important. In the case of the Hanjian, the forward pivot point is very close to the sweet spot, the, the blade node, which allows it, which allows you to not only have very little hand shock when you're cutting, but also allows you to receive an incoming attack and then easily pivot around it and continue to, to deliver a thrust against your opponent. So that's all for this time. Remember, different types of sword, different types of construction, all will yield very different types of output. Please endeavor to create your own charts. We're happy to see them and learn from them. And remember, each chart represents an individual sword, not necessarily a whole range of swords. Until next time, take care.